My dear students, dear guests, welcome to the last meeting of our joint seminar, Global Governance and the Role of Cities. This course is a partnership between the University of Tübingen, Global Awareness Education in Germany, and the Federal University of ABC in Brazil. In this course, we, we addressed various perspectives on the topics such as challenges faced by big cities, sustainable cities, migration, and now we are going to address health issues. We had guests from different countries and contexts that contributed with lectures, and these classes were interspersed with more practical classes in which students did case studies on Latin American, African, and Asian big cities. In both universities, the course is offered to students from different disciplines, in Tübingen as part of the transdisciplinary course program, and at the Federal University of ABC as a free extension course. The course's organizer are Professor Gilberto Rodriguez, Federal University of ABC, and me, Claudia Perez da Silva, University of Tübingen. Today, we'll have two guests in a roundtable discussion to close the course. The topic is the role of cities in global health governance, and the guests are Alberto Playman and Veronica Espinosa Serrano. I will ask my colleague, Professor Gilberto Rodriguez, to introduce our guests. Thank you, Glaucia. Uh, first of all, uh, it's a pleasure to have you, Alberto Clayman, and Dr. Veronica Espinosa with us. Um, I'd like to, to say hello to all participants of our course. And for me, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Alberto Kleiman, who is Senior Advisor for Strategic Alliances of the Pan American Health Organization, which is the America's Office of the World Health Organization based in, based in Washington, D.C. Currently, he is working as Senior Liaison Advisor at CAF, Development Bank of Latin America in Montevideo, Uruguay, helping the bank to develop a new health agenda for the region. Mr. Clayman joined uh, the Pan American Health Organization in 2015 as Director of External Relations, Partnerships and Resources Mobilization, position he held for seven years. Previously, he uh, served the Brazilian government in several positions. Uh, I would mention uh, the Ministry of uh, Health as international advisor, and also he was international advisor uh, for the presidents of the Republic of Brazil. And uh, last but not least, he worked, he has a, a, a very important experience at local level, uh, having worked uh, as international advisor in Sao Paulo municipality and also Santo André municipality. Uh, if you allow me to add a footnote in this in your bio, in your bio, Alberto, I'd like to to share with our participants that uh, I have the pleasure to know you for several years, many years, and we had I also had the pleasure to write uh, recently an article uh, that was published in Foreign Affairs Latin America. We we wrote, we wrote together this article to explore. Uh, challenges and possibilities of a new, a new multilateralism facing the pandemic of COVID-19. So, Alberto, it's a great pleasure to have you here among us, and we are very excited to, to listen to you in a few minutes. And now uh, I'd like to say that uh, for me, it's also a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Maria Veronica Espinosa Serrano. Uh, currently, she is a public health moni monitoring and evaluation specialist at the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. Uh, she was Minister of Public Health at the Ministry of Public Health of Ecuador from January 2017 and July 2019. Uh, she worked in several positions in the Ministry of Health of Ecuador before she was named as uh, Minister of Health. 
Um, and she has a, a, a very important experience in, in, in many functions related to public health in Ecuador in Latin America. Um, she has a very extensive curriculum, but I will close here my, my remarks and my introduction, uh, Dr. Veronica, if you would like to afterwards to, to share with us uh, and to highlight some of your experiences that could sh uh, shed light to your presentation, we will, we will be very thankful with you. So uh, I will uh, go back to, to Glaucia to, uh, for, the, for the beginning of this uh, round table. Thank you. Thank you, Gilberto. So now we are going to have the first contribution from Alberto Kleiman. So uh, let's share the screen. Thank you, Glaustia. Thank you so much, uh, Gilberto, for, for the kind, generous introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's a big pleasure for me to be with you today. And, and uh, let's say a double pleasure being and meeting again my, my old friend, Veronica Espinosa. She was a minister. She was a colleague. And then she, she became a minister of health of Ecuador was Let's say it was a victory for all of us in the in the in the health, the public health and the global health realm, having her a woman, a woman, a young woman uh, leading an important country in, in South America, and, and pushing uh, for the this this agenda. So uh, so it was a big pleasure, and and I like to say thank you for the organizers. Yeah, the the, the Federal University of the ABC and. And University of Tumingen uh, for for the invitation for participate, and and especially because this is a subject that is very close to my heart. As as Roberto mentioned, uh, I dedicated many years of my of my professional career discussing and working uh, on the role of cities and subnational governments in the national scenario. So thank you again, uh, Professor Roberto and Professor Glaucia. And congratulations for for the initiative. So, uh, moving moving forward in in my presentation, so the role of cities in the global health governance. Yeah, I will discuss this topic in five points. The first, I will bring a short definition on of what is global health governance and who are the players. Yeah, especially who are the players. And, and then I will talk about the role of cities as health actors in the health promotion agenda and how local development and health relate and their connections with the social determinants of health. And then I will talk about the health responsibilities and mandates of cities. And I use the Brazilian case, the Brazilian uh, uh, national health system, the SUS, yeah, the Sistema Único de Saúde in Portuguese, as a case, and, and, and it's interesting because the SUS assigns healthcare responsibilities to municipalities. It's one of the, 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 the rare cases around the world. My fourth point will bring some cases that show why cities are so important for the global health governance. And finally, I will conclude with some considerations about the war post COVID-19 and the SDGs having health in the center of the global health agenda and being everybody's business. So there are many graphs and maps on global health governance. I adapted some of them into this one you can see and I, in, in adding to that, I, I like very much the, the concept of global health governance from uh, Dr. Ilona Kigbush. She is one of the most prolific uh, authors on global health. And, and she refers global health governance as those institutions and processes of governance, which are related to an explicit health mandate such as the World Health Organization. So Ilona Kibbutz calls the participation of national and regional institutions in the arena as governance for global health. So don't let's be attentive here, not to, to, to mix 
global health governance, global health governance for governance for global health, which somehow, I mean, talking about governance supporting global health or promoting global health, which somehow contribute and influence the global health governance itself, yeah? So based on this concept, at the center of, of the graph, you can see the, the, the in orange circle, national states, the World Health Organization, other international organizations, and multilateral blocks like the G7, G20, the G77. Uh, I put in the in the center of the system because we've been seeing increasingly participation of these blocks uh, influencing the health uh, agenda, the global health agenda. Yeah. Uh, in the green area, in the green circle, uh, you see emerging actors, which are partnerships and initiatives such as Gavi and SEPI, the Global Fund, uh, uh, where uh, my, my friend Veronica is working right now. Like SEPI was responsible for the, the COVAX facility, responsible to deliver vaccines to fight the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. And they often are, let's say, uh, intersection zone between the private and the public. Yeah, they always, they, they, they usually bring uh, uh, public private partnerships. In the blue zone, uh, you see what it's called non state actors. Yeah, according to WHO, to the World Health Organization framework of engagement with non state actors, a document, an important document you can see in the WHO webpage. And it was a document discussed for more than five years and disciplines how WHO engages with these types of, of partners. Uh, Non-state actors are considered four types, philanthropic foundations, academic institutions, private sectors, private sector entities and NGOs. So, so you can see a little bit of the logos of all of them, all of these actors, but we don't see the cities here. And that's an interesting point that I want to bring in my next slide. So if cities are not actors of global health governments, maybe they are actors for global, of, of governance for global health, what they are, yeah, what they do, so always when the role of cities is a subject of discussion, I bet with you that someone will say something sustaining the argument about how cities are important, such as the real people live in the cities. And this is very true. But it's also true that national and state governments' decisions will impact not only on people's life, but also in local government initiatives. So how cities address health issues in the local, national, and global level? So they do it through their actions on everything related to local, social, cultural, environmental, economic, and urban development, which impact directly on people's health. is what it's called in health as the social determinants of health. The social determinants of health, it's an easy concept to understand when you imagine how people's uh, housing conditions or the access to clean water and sanitation, the quality of air, public transportation or private transportation, access to green areas or leisure, also security issues, public lightning, access to healthy and safe food. And all these issues related to public urban development affect public uh, people's health and well-being. So let me give you an example. When I work for the municipality of Santo André, uh, and this uh, municipality, this local government was very innovative and internationally recognized. So we were invited for many international conferences very often. Yeah, I was an international advisor there, young international advisor at that time. So one of these conferences we were uh, invited was specific, it was about a specific topic, which was uh, public security, public safety and gender. 
So the motto of the meeting was, if a city is safe for women, it's safe for everyone. So the discussion focused on how urban planning can improve safety for women in cities exclusively with urban interventions. We're not talking about policing, yeah, but we're talking about urban interventions, such as improving street lightning, or for example, avoiding finding wasteland, which are uh, places that sometimes occur acts of violence, and so on. So working on the social determinants of health, Municipalities are improving significantly people's health and well being. Internationally, cities promote this kind of actions and best practices through their own platforms and also with support of international, with, with support of international agencies uh, such as the World Bank, the European Union, not to mention the UN Habitat, the UN Specialized Agency for Human Settlements. So moving next. So in, in this sense, uh, cities are fundamental actors to implement national policies, but also to create their own policies and initiatives on the social determinants of health. For this reason, PAHO and WHO have been working with local government for many years on a series of initiatives, studies, guides, and toolkits which support cities in their actions. I projecting in this slide, some of them, they are accessible. You, you can access in their websites, your free documents for sure. So uh, in the same line, WHO created among other initiatives, the platform called Healthy Cities, uh, which promote a participatory process to respond to health issues that have emerged to urbanization. But it needs to be said that cities don't wait for international organizations or national governments to take their actions on health, to promote health policies and exchange their accumulated knowledge. They create the international cities networks in order to foster cooperation, present joint projects to international agencies, and advocate for the local interests in the international arena. So what about cities that have more responsibilities of management of the national health system? This is my next slide. And I like to bring, as I said at the beginning, the Brazilian case, the Sistema Unico de Saúde and the role of municipalities. It's a very interesting uh, case, not only because I'm Brazilian, but uh, because it's a really, uh, it's a tripartite uh, structure engaging the federal government, states and municipalities with the three of them with common and shared responsibilities. So the Brazilian constitution defined the national health system functions as a tripartite one. What is sharing common responsibilities between the three actors, the three entities of the, the Brazilian Federation. So it also creates the health national council with participation of the civil society, yeah? And, and they have this, this council has a deliberative uh, power. So the minister of health needs to comply with it. So the Brazilian model empowers cities, not only in their actions on social determinants, but also share responsibility for municipalities on the management of the health system. For example, municipalities in Brazil are responsible for emergency care units, and most important for primary care, uh, uh, which is a, the base of, of the universal health coverage, yeah? The constitution also uh, obliges the municipalities to allocate a minimum of 15% of the municipal health budget, the municipal budget in health. So uh, the most important element here I wanted to highlight is that the case uh, is that the highest level of the Brazilian constitution in the three levels of the Brazilian federations oblige work a coordination to implement the national health policy. So the, the political coordination and the management coordination are central 
to make functioning uh, uh, the Brazilian health system. So the element of, of governmental coordination is crucial in many aspects of health policies. The pandemic showed us how harmful the lack of coordination can be for health systems. Just to use an example, the use of mass mandate generated conflicts between local, state, and national levels in many countries, but also regarding the reopening of schools, social distancing, commerce and services, open hour, opening hours, public gatherings, etc. So the need for a global, national, and local coordination was never as important as it was during these difficult years. But in Brazil, the tripartite also allowed local and state governments to take the lead of the pandemic response. The federal government delayed the provision of vaccines, ventilators, and even oxygen. And even the national monitoring of cases was discontinued. In these situations, and partially thanks to their technical capacity, human resources, and institutional responsibilities, states and cities took the lead and were able to mitigate the damage and save lives. So moving forward uh, on the role of the cities, the next slide, I, I, I like to bring to you that cities can also be fantastic global health laboratories. In fact, they are, yeah? It's easier for a local government to innovate than states and national governments, which are much heavier and have bur heavier burdens on the healthcare itself management and are slower in terms of decision-making processes. Some of the most advanced public policies have been created in, city, in cities and many of them impact directly on people's health. Just to give some examples, public transportation reduce CO2 emissions, reduce traffic accidents, reduce respiratory diseases. Clean water and sanitation has a huge impact on reducing waterborne diseases and infant mortality. Exclusive bike lanes not only reduce traffic jams and number of cars and emissions, but also promote physical exercise, reducing non-communicable disease in the population, etc. Safe public spaces for leisure and walking can reduce violence and improve people's mental health mental health conditions. Efficient waste management has the potential to reduce proliferation of many vector-borne diseases such as dengue, Zika, chikungunya, malaria, and many others. So <clears throat> uh, all of this, of course, have to be evaluated and measured as highlighted by WHO in its guides for healthy cities, could not only impact inhabitants of cities, but also be scaled up in the state and national levels. And initiatives like Cities for Global Health, yeah, uh, um, that I showed in, in the previous uh, slide, which is a joint effort uh, by many international cities network as UCLG, for example, uh, uh, Metropolis and others, gather almost a thousand of the experience of cities during the pandemic. They are valuable lessons for this future, uh, for this and the future pandemics, yeah. We cannot ignore, on the other hand, that most of the cities in the world struggle to deliver basic service for the population and are sometimes completely dependent on national government budgets. This is also the case in Brazil, many Latin American countries and many countries around the world. So in this case, it's important to have a clear picture of the strengths and dares of cities on their challenges to improve people's health and well-being, as well as actors of global health governance. So I like to close uh, saying that uh, one thing is very important to underscore and remember. In order to reach the SDGs, all stakeholders are necessary and cities and local governments are essential. A good friend of mine uh, who works for UCLG told me once uh, that for every global problem, there is a local solution. 
well, maybe not for each one of the problems, but with no doubt for many of them. But as we saw previously, cities and local governments have a lot to say, to show, and teach about how to face global health problems, such as the COVID pandemic, with concrete and innovative solutions. As COVID-19 pandemic enters in a new moment, although it's important to say it's not finished yet, the international community has the opportunity to learn from the hits and misses in its response to the COVID pandemic and be prepared for the next emergencies in the global level. Maybe one of the lessons from this difficult experience is that as the, like the SDGs, we need a much better coordination and more and better partnerships among international agencies, governments, the private sector, and all stakeholders to be prepared for the next global health challenges. Therefore, cities must be recognized and be included as relevant stakeholders in global health governance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alberto, for your contribution. It was great to hear your experience. Now we are excited to hear um, our next guest, Maria Veronica Espinosa. So thank you for joining us. And now I'll give you the floor. Thank you very much. I would like to start by thanking the um, organization, organizers for inviting me and for being part of this forum. And it's, it's been um, really interesting to go back to uh, these issues since I've been involved mainly in HIV, TB, and malaria for a while. So it's 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 really uh, I'm really glad to be here, and I'm glad to share the floor with with Alberto, my dear friend, with who we had very interesting negotiations and discussions that allowed the issuing of the first um, resolution on um, access to health and universal health coverage for the Americas, which included the right to health as a main component, which was, um, as he said, a huge uh, uh, success for the region at that time. So uh, just to mention uh, a little bit of my background uh, before I start. Um, as Vice Minister of Health, of uh, Health Governance and Surveillance in the Ministry of Health in Ecuador, we started the program uh, Healthy Municipalities in Ecuador to engage all municipalities in health issues and specifically to involve them in the um, social determinants of health uh, to try to include uh, some resource allocation, but also the political will to uh, promote changes in access to water, sanitation, uh, safety, uh, equity, gender equity, as part of the uh, national response um, to several specific health issues as malnutrition, as uh, maternal mortality. And um, we um, realized that the efforts that were being undertaken by the Ministry of Health and the health sector specifically were not sufficient to address these issues and we needed to engage local actors and specifically municipalities if we wanted to achieve the results that we um, planned um, as part of uh, the health project that we had at the moment. So um, then we saw some of the results of those initiatives uh, uh, during the, the, the earthquake that took place in 2016 in Ecuador that was uh, a very big uh, health crisis uh, after the earthquake. And we saw some of the results of these initiatives, uh, the work that municipalities uh, engaged during this situation and during crisis. Um, and we believe that this is one of the good examples of how the involvement of local authorities, cities, not necessarily municipalities, cities in the whole definition that this uh, word can have, um, it's a major asset and probably a necessity um, uh, to address health in the comprehensive definition of health. So. Uh, I will not repeat myself with what uh, Albert, Alberto already mentioned, but I think that um, in order to understand the role of cities in health and in health governance specifically, it's important to go over the evolution on how the global community understands and commonly defines health and how we achieve uh, this concept of health. So the way we define and the way we understand health has uh, a main impact 
on um, how we address health issues and what the role of the, of the different actors is in health outcomes. And it, will, it, it also has a huge impact on uh, health crisis and emergency management. Um, it's very different to address a crisis when you are understanding health as just curing disease and when you are understanding health from the perspective of complete well-being. So the evolution of the global approach to address health has changed significantly over the ages. It went from this very biologist and medicalized in a definition where the focus was on the physical condition and uh, the disease component. Plus health was the opposed of disease. And it changed to a much more comprehensive definition, uh, which included the concept of physical, mental, and social well being, which is a definition that we are using right now. And these changes in definition were very closely related with the Declaration of Health as a Human Right, which is not new. Uh, we have the first uh, declaration or conception of health as a human right in 1946 with the WHO Constitution. This was then repeated in 1948 uh, during the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And then it has been repeated over and over in several international treaties. And now it has been recognized as a human right in many of national constitutions, especially in the Latin American um, and in the Americas and in the Latin American region, but also in many other countries around the world. Um, and this has changed completely the approach of uh, how we achieve health in such a comprehensive uh, manner. So to guarantee the right of health to all and to achieve this complete state of well-being in the physical, biological, but also in the, in the psychological and social component, this very biological, physical, and healthcare approach was no longer sufficient. So when we think that healthcare systems were designed to cure disease and not necessarily to prevent disease or to guarantee this state of well being, um, we realize that focusing on healthcare and in services and in the health sector is no longer sufficient. And um, there was the need to recognize that health outcomes were determined by many other aspects different than medical components. It's not only a matter of pathogens, physiology, healthcare services. Um, so we started exploring as a society new concepts or new definitions of how to address uh, health. And this is not necessarily new. When we look back at the history and we see Bircho uh, already in, I, I believe it was in the 1840s, uh, he already mentioned when addressing the typhus epidemics in Europe that if medicine was to achieve the, the, the great task uh, of, of preventing these outbreaks and, and getting over these common outbreaks during this period of time, they needed to enter the political and social life. So already at that time, we, as the society realized that it was not enough with curing the disease, that health had something bigger behind it. Um, and uh, so this idea of social determinants of health that Alberto mentioned was already around many, many years ago. But it, it, it wasn't until the recent decades that we started really exploring and doing research and providing evidence to prove that health was beyond the health sector. And these determinants that, that were called by, by Marmot and Wilkinson uh, actually in 1999 as what is behind health, these determinants, the social determinants of health that accounted for the health outcomes even in a higher weight and in a higher percentage that biological components or even the medical capacity that the societies or the health systems had to address uh, health issues. So um, determinants of health, as Alberto already mentioned, uh, as are these many factors that combined together will affect the health of individuals and communities. And they explain whether people are healthy or not, and they will be determined by different cir circumstances or, or, or environment. Um, so many issues that were not considered in the past as important, such as the income, education level, relationship with friends and family, have a very considerable impact on health outcomes and 
these factors that were thought to be outside of, of, of the health sector were now a very important component of uh, the achievement of the right to health. So the, um, the social determinants of health uh, have this idea behind of these forces, these conditions which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, and they shape the conditions of daily life. And this goes beyond the own decisions and choices of people because they are determining those choices and those decisions. And they include economical policies, the systems development, the social norms, the social policies, the political systems, the resource allocation, the resource distribution, equity, gender barriers, and all these components shape in the way people live and shape the health and the well-being of people in a determinant way. So how big is the impact of social determinants of health and what does evidence say and why cities are so important in the attainment of the right to health? According to the evidence, only 20% of health outcomes depend on biology and genetics. That is at the most. And 80% of health is actually accounted to health determinants. And within that 80%, the non-biological causes, um, for example, social and economical factors, health behaviors and economical factors are the responsible of the 80% of the health outcomes. And when I'm referring to health outcomes, I am referring to aging, to life expectancy, morbidity, mortality, and um, many other specific indicators for health. So if 80% of health outcomes are highly related to policy and decision-making, that usually takes place within cities at different level, at, at the local uh, definition of, um, of policies and also within the communities, then the 80% of health is actually in the power and in the control of cities, of citizens, of citizens and communities. So I, I would like to share in, in the time that I have left just a few examples on uh, from my experience on how this role of cities regarding social determinants of health can be um, the very significant um, in the positive and in the negative uh, outcomes of health. So for example, when we are referring to environmental factors, uh, we have access to water and, sanit uh, and, and sanitation. And when we see the struggle we have in Latin American countries and in many countries in Africa context as well, to um, eliminate diseases such as malaria and dengue and vector-borne diseases. And we see the efforts and the resources that are invested in vector control, that are invested in treatment, in early diagnosis, which are the main approach that we have from the health sector to these health problems. And, and we see that one of the biggest um, interventions of the main interventions that have had the best results in addressing vector and borne diseases is access to sanitation and water uh, in rural and urban areas. And how much is invested to address uh, malaria and Zika and dengue elimination in specifically these issues, we see the disbalance and how this issue has not been approach probably in the most effective way. Um, when we discuss with local authorities on their role and the, uh, the importance of the decisions of sanitation and access to water was to prevent uh, many, many, many of the, of the most common um, diseases in, in childhood, and I, I, I insist um, vector-borne diseases, um, this seemed very new to local authorities. And uh, one of the main strategies was, that was implemented in the healthy municipalities strategies was to include a specific set of indicators to progress towards the achievement of 100% coverage of sanitation and access to water in those cities as one of the indicators to certify the cities um, as healthy um, municipalities. So that is just one example as how the decisions that are taken within municipalities and that our local decisions can severely and 
hugely impact uh, health outcomes. And this repeats itself in many other uh, components of the social determinants of health, such as social and economical factors. And for me, maybe the most important one is in health behaviors, this idea of a healthy lifestyle. And when I hear the word and the wording of healthy lifestyle, sometimes I, I, I really don't like these words because lifestyle seems like um, a decision, uh, something that people decide to do or not to do uh, based on their knowledge or even in, on their um, self-awareness or even in, a, in their own responsibility over their health and, uh, and, and the health outcomes for the community. But actually, um, lifestyle is not a reality uh, for the majority of the population of the world because it's based on the concept that people have the choice to uh, do exercise, to live a healthy life, to access uh, healthy food, uh, or even the decision on what to eat, to smoke or not to smoke. But in the reality for many, many, many people, actually the majority of the population in uh, middle and low income countries, this is not a choice. Um, we tell them to make the healthy choices, but we want people to do exercise without parks. We want people to walk when it's unsafe to walk and when, when we don't have sidewalks and when um, pollution is so high that people can barely go out in, in, in their own uh, backyard or, or, or in their, or their, their own public spaces. Um, we expect uh, people to do exercise, but commuting usually takes three or four hours in big cities, um, which will not leave much free time uh, for people to exercise or to do um, different activities other than working. And uh, this idea that these are choices is changing and becoming more and more responsibility of policy making and allowing these to actually be choices for people to make. So we cannot expect people to have a healthy lifestyle if we don't provide um, these opportunities and these conditions that make it possible. And that is for me, the most important component of um, and, and, and uh, social determinants and health and the relationship with uh, the role of cities, the role of municipalities, the role of communities. There is this whole uh, evidence and research now being done on the importance of communities and uh, social networking and the support the community can provide to people for aging children, women, um, that has a major impact in health. And that is also part of the definition I have of a city. A city is also people living within cities and the role these communities can play uh, in promoting health. So just um, to finish, I would like to mention a few uh, important examples on how cities have uh, become a, a main and a very important actor in health governance and in health outcomes during the pandemics and during health crises. So um, during the, um, the, the, the pandemics, what we have seen is a huge disruption in health services in all uh, components of health services because all health resources were, were focused to uh, the national responses for COVID, which was obvious, but within the, the, the national responses to mitigate the impact of COVID, for example, in tuberculosis, uh, AIDS and malaria, and also in other strategical programs such as vaccination coverage for children or maternal mortality. What we see is that the way systems have managed to mitigate the impact of COVID is through local interventions. So the more decentralized the services and the responses and the adaptation of activities and interventions are the best, the results and the faster the uh, recovery from uh, the disruptions created by COVID, by, by COVID are. And this is very heterogeneous between uh, cities. And we see that, for example, cities as Bogota have managed to um, establish very effective mitigation actions for recovering uh, HIV prevention services uh, for key populations uh, through community-led activities, through the distribution 
of um, multi-month uh, medication antiretrovirals within um, uh, within uh, uh, Bogota through uh, community-led and municipality-led services, and they managed to uh, um, uh, increase the coverage and the, and the activities and the services, even to the levels uh, before the pandemic. Uh, but we do not see the same results in other cities that do not have the same resources and the same capacities that we see in big cities. So um, the main message maybe in, in, in the results, we are already seeing the preliminary results from the pandemic uh, within um, uh, uh, the health sector is that, again, the closer the response is to the community and to the people and to the individuals, the faster and the better the results are. Uh, and that is very important in crisis management and uh, in, in the response to a pandemic, because not only the activities need to reshape and adapt to provide health services and react to the pandemic and to the specific health condition that is causing um, the crisis, in this case, uh, COVID, but also to maintain and to keep the, the basic services such as HIV, maternal, childcare uh, in place. And that is one of the huge um, uh, gains I think we, we, we have from the pandemic is realizing that local uh, participation and the role of communities, cities, and local authorities uh, in health uh, was, as we imagined, um, very, very, very important and even, uh, I think, uh, essential. And finally, um, one important thing is that this diversity of uh, results is very much related with the diversity of cities that we have. And when we say cities, sometimes I think it's it's a very wide um, um, concept because we can refer to cities as uh, the municipalities where we have a more standardized definition, the government of a local uh, authority that is in charge of a group of population and in a specific territory. but. Within this definition of cities, I think we, we have many other um, many other actors and many other um, different uh, contributors to the health sector. And I, and I believe community-led organizations, civil, civil society organizations, uh, community-based organizations, neighborhoods uh, have a huge role in, in emergency responses. And, in, 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 in the health system and in the health uh, idea that, that I mentioned before. Uh, but again, city is not an homogenous and uh, a unique concept. And we have very different cities and very different capacities. We see big cities such as Bogota, Rio de Janeiro, Mexico, um, the uh, DF, but we also see very, very small cities uh, that have 2,000 inhabitants, 200 inhabitants, and we don't have a solution, a one-size-fits-all intervention that can be applied to all these different actors when we are uh, referring to social determinants of, of health or the role they can have in health. And we see this in uh, indicators such as maternal mortality, where we see that maternal mortality usually is much higher in urban um, uh, areas and in uh, in rural areas and in urban areas and in small municipalities and in bigger municipalities and this is very much related with uh, the dynamics of power and resource allocation. So I believe this uh, subject of governance, power, cities, and health is a very interesting subject that needs much more discussion. And I, I, I will be very honored and happy to continue the discussion over with uh, all of you um, in the next uh, segment of, 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 of this forum. And um, I think this opens a huge uh, area of, of discussion, of research, and, and of course, uh, the future of health and how we are going to face the, the new uh, normal after COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria Veronica Espinosa, for your great contribution. We are very glad to have you both here with us. So now I am closing the public part of our event. I thank you for all that, for those that were watching us. And now we turn to the 
close discussion. So thank you so much.